A warning before we begin. Today's episode will include discussions of incarceration, pregnancy loss, bleeding, and medical negligence. Please consider this when deciding if and where you will listen. Pamela Wynn was a registered nurse and a single mother of two boys when she was sentenced to 78 months in federal prison. She was also pregnant. But while incarcerated, Pamela found herself shackled any time she was transported. One day, as she was being loaded into a van, shackled, she fell. Later, when she began bleeding, concerns of a miscarriage immediately floated through her mind. But her pleas for medical attention went unaddressed by the prison staff. At 20 weeks pregnant, Pamela miscarried. Because of my own lived experience of serving a 78-month federal sentence where I was pregnant um, and I was at a facility where I was told that they didn't expect to have women, they definitely didn't expect to have a pregnant woman. There was absolutely, quote unquote, nothing that they could do for me. And when I questioned what nothing was, they said, we can't, we can't even offer you a prenatal vitamin. And then being shackled um, and the shackling caused me to fall and miscarry my baby and listening to the medical staff and the officers debate about what to do with me because they didn't have a plan. As I'm hemorrhaging and experiencing my miscarriage, um, the medical staff was saying, we should call 911, she's losing a lot of blood. Whereas the correctional officers were like, no, we should call the marshals. And I'm there in the middle begging and pleading, you know, for the life of my baby as well as my own now because I'm hemorrhaging to just please call 911, which they finally did. And then the marshals met me at the door and immediately cuffed me by an ankle and a wrist to the bed, which is how I endured the remainder of my miscarriage with two male officers between my legs that refused to give me any privacy. They didn't even understand the need to offer me privacy. Um, even when being asked if they couldn't leave out the room, if they could stand at the head of my bed, they still refused and remained between my legs the entire time. And to add insult to injury, when asked where was the linen, linen that I had come with, that I had bled on, because once they were able to stabilize me and do an ultrasound to check the status of my baby, it was determined that I had passed the fetus and they needed to see it to make sure all of the parts were there. And the officers were like, oh, we threw that in the trash. So not only am I sitting there dehumanized because I have these men between my legs, now to hear that they threw my baby in the trash and the tone, the nonchalantness of it was as if they felt like it was actually trash. Um, and then to put me in solitary confinement immediately after this occurred. So, and my story is just one of thousands and it's not even the worst. I'm Cheyenne Daniels, race and politics reporter for The Hill. And this is The Switch Up. In our second episode on the maternal mortality crisis, we're examining the health care of incarcerated pregnant people, including the practice of shackling and the devastating outcomes. Are other options available? And if so, how do we implement new plans to end maternal and fetal deaths in prison? In our last episode, we explored how the maternal mortality crisis disproportionately affects Black women and other women of color. These disparities persist, and in some cases may be worse when we look at the incarcerated population. In 2021, Black women were imprisoned at 1.6 times the rate of white women. Women who identify as Hispanic or Latina were imprisoned at 1.3 times the rate of white women, according to a 2023 report by The Sentencing Project a nonprofit dedicated to criminal justice reform. Every year, about 58,000 pregnant people enter prisons and jails. A study by the Pregnancy and Prison Statistics Project found that nationally, 4% of women entering prison and 3% of women entering jail are pregnant. Pregnant incarcerated people have higher rates of poor perinatal outcomes, such as miscarriage and babies born prematurely, compared to women in the general population. In many ways, Wanda Bertram of the Prison Policy Initiative said, this is because many jails and prisons are often not equipped with the necessary health care that pregnant people need. 
Prisons, as everyone knows, are not facilities that are designed to provide people, you know, the, the best in care, mobility, diet, those kinds of things, right? These are facilities that are designed to punish people. And so when you bring someone into a prison or a jail who's pregnant, they face all these issues immediately. Issues like um, prison food, it's notoriously not nutritious, right? And many incarcerated people and advocates for incarcerated people talk about a lack of calorically sufficient diets. Now, pregnant people, you would think, would get at least some supplementary um, food for in their in their diet because you know because of what they're going through and many pregnant people report that they don't and they're always hungry right there's also the issue of uh, people who are pregnant and might have high risk pregnancies for example someone who has or has had an opiate addiction or an alcohol that usually translates to a higher risk pregnancy uh, a few years ago we looked at the the various codified policies that prisons have around pregnancy and we looked at whether there's a policy in a sample of I think about 21 state prisons around dealing with a high risk pregnancy and most states didn't seem to have anything. So they're not taking special steps to make sure that women, you know, who are facing these these particular risks are actually getting the care that they need. And that doesn't even begin to cover the other chronic health conditions people of color are more likely to experience, such as diabetes, heart issues, hypertension, and HIV. These conditions aren't necessarily due to something these communities are doing wrong, as opposed to the lack of healthcare that already plagues black and brown communities in the general population. But Pamela points out that part of why healthcare for incarcerated pregnant people is so bad is because healthcare in general for women behind bars is lacking, from necessities like menstrual supplies to clothing, like bras. As far as what healthcare looks like, um, for incarcerated women, there is basically none. Um, to be frank with you, um, definitely in my situation, I received didn't receive anything. And so when I say there is none, what I'm saying is that there is not a standard standardization of care for pregnant women in facilities, whether they are local, county, federal, there's no standardization of care. Each entity, each facility does their own thing when it comes to how they decide to care for not just pregnant women that are incarcerated, but women, period, that are incarcerated. Um, so that's one of the big issues that we have that makes this work so essential, so um, urgent, and so vast um, because everyone has their own way of dealing with it. None of the penal institutions are required to have um, joint commission or certifications or anything like that. So they choose that at their own, you know, discretion. Same with the private facilities, and they are definitely conducting things their own way because they are private. Most places don't have contracts with OBGYNs. Um, they usually don't feel like there's a need to unless an emergency occurs. And then when that emergency occurs, they are scurrying around trying to figure out how to handle that which is usually just taking a woman to whatever the closest hospital or whatever it is to be seen. State facilities and federal facilities do tend to do a little bit better where they do have some communication with um, healthcare professionals that specialize in women's need, but again, nothing on site. So unless a woman is experiencing something of extreme you know, urgency or emergency, you know, there's nobody on site to see them. And a lot of times when these cases come up in an emergency way, um, depending on where the facility is located, because, you know, most of them are located in rural areas, will they get to a place in time, you know, before the woman is in a dire situation, you know, life or death thing before they can be seen? When it comes to the issue of shackling in particular, Advocates like Pamela have tried to highlight just how dangerous this practice can be for mothers and their fetuses. Being pregnant imbalances your equilibrium, so they're already off balance because of a pregnant baby. Shackling adds to that, so they're more prone to falling. And then, like in my case, I was black boxed, which means that my wrist cuffs were attached to a double chain around my belly and held my arms in place like this. So even when falling, I was not even able to brace myself or try to catch myself because I was stuck in a fixed position, as well as my ankles were also cuffed and connected with a chain. 
between my legs. So all of that hardware and you're in a fixed position. So the fall is like imagining a tree falling. It's a very hard, a flat, very flat fall, um, a free fall, as you will, um, with no way to brace or protect yourself. Not only that, the double trains around your belly, you know, can cause constriction. It can precipitate contractions because of the weight of these chains. There are a number of things, even with circulation, with the cuffs, because they're designed to get tighter as a person moves. So just restricting proper circulation, which is really adequate when you have another body inside of you that's relying on your proper circulation. So yeah, there are a number of things, not to mention all of the mental things that go along with it psychologically you know being shackled and what that means in your psyche to know that you're sitting there bound up in chains. Despite increased attention to the maternal mortality crisis advocates like Wanda say much of what incarcerated pregnant people face is unknown to the general public and some of that may be intentional. I think that I think that people aren't really aware of this, and I think that you know that's that's not the public's fault. It, it's um, it's something that has to do with the fact that we have a massive prison system that's very focused on keeping uh, keeping the public shielded from what happens behind bars, right? Um, and we and we have to to be frank, a news media that is uh, you know very focused on demonizing people who go to prison or go to jail. And so when we think about even mothers that go to prison or jail are often demonized in the media, and we think, well, that's where they that's where they should be. That's where they need to be. For example, there have been successful successful prosecutions of women in multiple states over the last several years who have drug addictions and are pregnant. So prosecutors are, are coming after these women who are just, they're using drugs and the prosecutors are saying, well, that's going to be a danger to your to your child. You're, this is fetal endangerment. So, so people are being put behind bars for quote unquote, you know, endangering their child, even though the science does not back this up, right? The science does not suggest that, you know, you're more likely to have a stillbirth or you're like, likely to be killing your child by using drugs while you're pregnant. People who are, you know, are using drugs while they're pregnant do need care, but that's not that's not really what these states are trying to provide because like we were talking about, they're the prisons are not providing <laughs> opiate treatment. Um and and so so really what's happening is that there's this political mobilization I think that that is demonizing women who are uh are poor, are using drugs, are homeless, right? All, all of these different things that might might make it easy to say, well, you know, they're, they're not like the other mothers, right? And that's, I think, what creates a political environment where, you know, we we kind of subconsciously turn away from all the things that I think if you think about it, you know that prisons are not a good place for people to be pregnant or people to be giving birth. But the lack of health care for incarcerated pregnant people also affects those who have yet to be sentenced. One of those women was Tiana LeBoy. Tiana's attorney, Ken Krajewski, explains that when Tiana went into York Correctional Institution in Neantic, Connecticut as a pre-sentenced inmate, she was already two months pregnant. As a pre-sentenced inmate, Tiana was supposed to receive prenatal care. And she did, though the amount of care she received was minimal, Ken said, and she was housed in the mental health facility of the institution. When Tiana was around seven and a half months pregnant, she went into labor. She went to medical and they said, here, have a glass of water, um, relax, you're not in labor. Five days this went on. Um, and just to, to be certain, Tiana was 19 at this point and she had never given birth before. And so here is a woman who needs mental health, who's pregnant, who's in a normal cell, on a normal steel bed with a quarter inch thick foam mattress pad. If we think about pregnancy, women who are pregnant have a terrible time sleeping. Um, you know, they Boppy invented a pillow specifically for women to cuddle with um, so that it makes their legs feel better when they're pregnant. So she's getting none of the sort of physical creature comforts that pregnant women uh, tend to rely on in outside of the world. So she finally, after five days of labor, um, you know, she repeatedly went to medical and they repeatedly sent her away. She woke up and, and chow is it like five o'clock in the morning? It's super early in prisons. She um, struggled her way. She was bleeding and she used a t-shirt as a pad and she struggled her way to the kitchen, uh, you know, the, the mess hall. And we got the video 
of her, you know, they have fixed camera videos in the hallways and we got the video and um, you can see her leaning against the wall while she's in line waiting, like sort of grabbing herself and being very, very uncomfortable when she's in labor. Right. She's she she went and the and the nurse was like, this isn't labor. She's like, I had fluid coming out. And they're like, they didn't even do a test on the fluid to see if it was amniotic fluid. You know how they're they're supposed to do a test on the fluid. So Tiana gets breakfast, doesn't really eat, makes her way back to her cell. The emergency buzzer in her cell doesn't work. Her cellmate is a mother of four. So her cellmate has, you know, experienced birthing. And Tiana had talked to her mother a number of times while she was incarcerated about the pregnancy. And she had remembered that her mother said, when the baby is coming out, it's going to feel like you're you're going number two. Um, and so Tiana had an, an in, she was back in her cell after breakfast and she had an incredible pressure. And um, she sat on the toilet because she thought she was defecating. And in reality, out came baby Nevea and baby Nevea landed in the toilet. The video of Tiana giving birth is under protective order, but Ken described it as one of the craziest pieces of film he'd ever seen in his life. When the nurses finally came in with a birth kit, they were too late to do an APGAR test to check her baby's heart rate, muscle tone, and other vital signs to see if medical care or emergency care was needed. Tiana's baby has since been diagnosed with autism and is nonverbal. But the trauma of Tiana giving birth continued even after the nurses arrived. One of the nurses realizes that the baby was born in the toilet and said, oh, how cute. The baby took its first swim. They, they cut the umbilical cord and they, they, they get her into the ambulance and they get her to the hospital and she stays in the hospital. While she's in the hospital, she's shackled to the bed. She never gets to, you know, she's in the hospital for like 10, 14 days and she gets hospital bonding with the baby. But then the baby's just ripped from her. Um, you know, she had PTSD going into this. She... She was in for a relatively violent offense, and when she did plead guilty, um, they took a significant amount of time off her sentence, but she still got time left, and she asked us to file a lawsuit, so we did. In 2020, Tiana received a settlement of about $527,336 for the cost of her medical care and incarceration from August 15th, 2017 to June 5th, 2020. She also received just over $13,563 for her baby's medical costs from February 13th, 2018 to March 24th, 2020. But in many ways, Tiana was lucky to receive restitution of any kind, in part because so many barriers stand in the way of prisoners receiving justice for negligence, including at the federal level. One of those barriers is former President Bill Clinton's 1996 Omnibus Prison Litigation Reform Act, or PLRA. Prisoners have to exhaust all administrative remedies. They have to file grievances. They have to follow up on those grievances. They have to, and, and we talk about ripeness is what we call it. Like it, the prisoner has to have gone through all le three levels of grievances in order to exhaust PLRA uh, requirements to meet the bar to file suit in federal court. And there's a case out of the Eighth Circuit uh, about a woman who gave birth in a prison cell. And that, that law was already set for us. So the state kind of filed the bullshit motion because the Eighth Circuit had already said pregnant women don't have any grievances to exhaust. If you give birth in a prison cell, it ain't happening again. There's no repetition. There's no way that there's any way that she can exhaust her administrative remedies because she's not going to give birth again in a prison cell. The switch up reached out to the Federal Bureau of Prisons, but they declined an interview. Still, Ken argues that many of the issues facing incarcerated pregnant people is tied up in misogyny, racism, and the dehumanization of the incarcerated. But that's not to say there are no solutions. Take Tennessee State Senator Ramush Akbari, for instance. Akbari, a Democrat, had pushed her state to consider the health care of pregnant incarcerated people. And because of her advocacy, her bill went into effect in Tennessee last summer. Senate Bill 2796 prohibits restraints being placed on a pregnant inmate's ankles, legs, or waist during labor or delivery. It also states that a pregnant inmate cannot be shackled behind the back or be attached to another inmate. The legislation has some exceptions, however, such as if a pregnant inmate is being moved, is an immediate flight risk, or poses a threat to themselves, their fetus, or others. Still, in those cases, 
the law requires the least restrictive restraints to be used. I think anytime you hear shackling, you think about, you know, the the unfortunate history of slavery in our country. And and it does kind of draw those images to mind. But for me, it's just a, a childbirth is already a difficult experience for women. It's something that, you know, is extremely risky for the mother and also for the child. And so to think about a woman who needs to be able to move around, needs to be able to be in positions that are best for herself and the child and being restrained. I mean, it's such such an inhumane image. And I think even for the mother, I mean, she's, you know, giving birth. That's something that will forever change her life, bond her to an individual who will, you know, could grow up to be president. And then during this moment, this to be love and joy and, and everything else, they are being dehumanized in such a horrific way. And so I thought, you know, there's there's no way that we can continue to allow this to exist. They're already incarcerated, giving birth and to have to be shackled or chained to a bed and their movements restricted. is just not only unacceptable, uh, you know, in a healthcare perspective, but also just in a basic human being perspective. You know, Tennessee is an extremely strong pro-life state. And for me, I tell folks, look, if you're pro-life, that's from the womb to the tomb. And I think a lot of people were surprised that women were being shackled during childbirth when they were incarcerated, especially some of my colleagues in the Senate that, you know, they were just like, this is this should be a non-brainer, right? We ran into some problems in the House. We had some committee chairs, committee members that said, well, you know what? They could be a danger to the doctor or the nurse. And, you know, if they wanted a different experience, perhaps they shouldn't have committed a crime. It, it was completely... Um, ignoring the fact that that we are all people, right? As Akbari works in her state, others, like Pamela, are working around the nation. Pamela's organization, Restore Her, has been working tirelessly to pass legislation that would establish better health care for incarcerated pregnant people. Pamela and Restore Her have managed to successfully advocate for the passage of the Dignity for Incarcerated Women Act in 21 states. Now, they're working to pass the Women's Care Act, which would provide childbirth alternatives, resources, and education to prevent pregnant people having to give birth behind bars. Women are still being shackled. Women are still being placed in solitary. And it's because, one, we don't have data to know. We don't know the real number, true number, of women that are incarcerated in the United States because the data is not provided to us. Um, So that's one Peace. And because of that peace implementation of even the things that we put into law, there's no overview. We don't know, you know, a way to keep up with making sure that these laws that we pass are being implemented without that data. Um, so implementation is a big problem right now. Federally, part of what Pamela and Restore Her want to see is that a pregnant person's sentence would not start until a minimum of 12 weeks postpartum. We're not saying that these women will not be accountable for whatever mistake that they made. But what we're saying is allow them the time to have a safe, healthy pregnancy, deliver their baby in a safe, healthy environment of their choosing, and then give them ample time to bond with their baby, to be able to breastfeed, and to have time to make proper arrangements for when it's time for them to go serve their time, that they don't have the anxiety and the stress and the psychological trauma of wondering where their baby is, if their baby is being cared for, and how will they get their baby back? Because that's what women are up against now. Pamela is not alone in her vision of pregnancy-free prisons. Wanda and the Prison Policy Initiative are among other advocates calling for alternatives for those who are pregnant and serving time behind bars. This is an issue that we that actually does count as a pro-life issue. And I think that when we're talking about, you know, women potentially losing their lives and um, babies potentially being harmed behind bars, it, we can start with the premise that incarceration of pregnant people is cruel and is not something that we should be doing in this country, right? Alternatives. There are several states that have actually put this into practice. Um, about eight states, as far as we know, have implemented laws that either restrict the amount of uh, the the distance that a a pregnant person can be incarcerated away from their family so that when they eventually do have the child, it's easier for them to visit, or they have implemented some kind of diversion program such that if you are pregnant, you qualify for a particular program that, you know, uh, possibly um, requires you to, to go through drug treatment or mental health treatment. And if you fail the program, you go to prison. But if you succeed, you can stay out of prison, right? So these are pathways out of the legal system that some states have put into place. And I think that, you know, if if a handful of states can do it, all states can do it. What's important, I think, is to, again, 
make sure that women who are convicted of violent offenses um, or who may have a history of, you know, more, more criminal justice history than other women are not automatically excluded from these programs because, you know, this is something that can easily render a diversion program totally useless even after you've done all this work to create it, right? And we've seen this before. Illinois, for example, has one of the most potentially robust diversion programs for uh, women and babies that, you know, exists in the U.S., but it's been totally underused for the last several years just because of the way it was set up. Judges weren't informed that it was actually a thing. Um, and I think that there were some restrictions on who could be in the program that, that kept people out of it. So there are models for this, right? I think that noticing the amount of pregnant people who are going to prisons should, for a lot of people, be a wake up call and, you know, help people notice, all right, you know, the legal system does not care, you know, if you are going to be, if your health is going to be at risk, if your baby's health is going to be at risk by, you know, putting you in prison, we're going to put you in prison anyway. But the fight to end disastrous prison births isn't over. And Pamela has words of encouragement for those facing what may seem like impossible, horrible outcomes. Don't be afraid to use your voice. Um, it's the best advocate that you have speaking up and saying what you need and what's important to you. Because in a lot of these situations, um, these women that lose their lives and the babies that lose their lives is because we don't speak up. Don't feel like because you are incarcerated or um, you are under, um, I guess, the uh, a legal process where you may be still going back to court and have not been convicted or sentenced yet that you don't have to, the right to say anything. Um, I know many women think that because they are incarcerated, they don't have rights. You still have rights. And so it's very important though, if you're not voicing what your needs are, what your complications are, what your problems are, what's urgent for you, then that's always the excuse of why you didn't receive it. So if nothing else, Make sure you voice it. Make sure you document it. Documenting is very important because then you can show where you voiced it, who you voiced it to, and what was the outcome. And that's very critical and very helpful when we're fighting to get all of these things changed and to get folks treated like human beings. But you are your best advocate. Don't be afraid to speak up. Cheyenne Daniels, race and politics reporter for The Hill, and from all of us at The Hill, thanks for listening to this episode of The Switch Up. We'll have more episodes delving into the intersection of race and politics soon, so be sure to follow The Hill at T-H-E-H-I-L-L on all social media for future updates, including episode drops and articles. And you can watch my full interviews with all of our guests on YouTube. The Switch Up was created and written by me. Script editing for this episode was done by Steph Thomas. Audio production by Christian Carter and Casey Brady. Our booking producer is Casey Brady, and our social media manager is Tia Shepard. <laughs>